We are continuing on in the Gospel of Luke. We have been looking at John the Baptist, John the Baptist's ministry, John the Baptist's message, and he was a bold fellow. Uh, we're going to look at that today. So, okay. First of all, my it's interesting. Uh, Laurel's uncle, uncle-in-law had passed away. We went to a funeral. And we went to talk to the wife, Laurels, and, and she grabbed me by the shoulders and she says, I listen to your messages online every week. Well, it couldn't be every week because there's weeks I don't have the mic on and we mess up, but <laughs> almost every week. So it goes beyond this here. But she said she always likes my joke at the beginning. I like this one. Here it is. My kids refuse to eat beef tongue because it comes out of a cow's mouth. So I fed them some eggs. <laughs> Where does that come from? Huh? <laughs> All right. Let's get into our text for the day. We're only going to cover three verses. I only have three points, but I got a lot in there. We'll go our time. Luke 3, verses 18, 19, and 20. So with many other exhortations, he preached, talking about John the Baptist, he preached good news to the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, who had been reproved by him for Herodias, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done, added this to them all. So Herod had done a bunch of bad things. John reproved him about it, but he added one more bad thing to it. He locked up John in prison. All right, so here's my outline. Number one, the summary of John's preaching, verse 18. Point number two, John's boldness in speaking out against sin, even Herod's sin, he didn't, oh, I better be careful because I don't want to get in trouble. He was bold to speak out about the sin. And point number three, John was locked up in prison. We'll look at that whole story. Luke only gives us a little short phrase, but the other gospels expand and tell us what happened to John's life. We'll look at that. Okay, so here's my outline. Point number one, summary of John's preaching. So with many other, notice this word, exhortations, he preached good news to the people. So I got some comments here. Exhortation. John gave the people exhortation. Well, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word that is there is the, is the word parakaleo. The second part, kaleo, we get our English word call. From that, it means to call out. And para is a Greek preposition that they stick on the front of a lot of words. It means to come alongside of. Parallel, we get our word from, okay? So the word literally means to be called alongside. Um, as an aid, as a help, as a lawyer, as a counselor. It can be translated, it's kind of a very broad word. It's used a lot in the New Testament. The Greek word uh, in the original manuscripts, it can be translated as counsel, comma. It can also be translated as comfort. When John, when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit coming, the comforter coming, that's this word, a noun form of this word. The para, you have heard the word, our paraclete. Okay, it comes right from this word. Um, he, it can be translated as comfort, counsel, to encourage, to urge, to appeal, or to exhort. All right, I'm going to get some of you involved. What do you think of when you think of the word exhort? Let's get some ideas. When you hear the word, if I'm going to exhort you, what do you think about? Okay, call you to task, okay? And we're going to look at some other words that are even stronger than that a little bit here. Call you to task. But the word is really quite, what do I want to say, quite light because it can mean encourage, it can mean urge, it can mean comfort as well. So I, I guess I always think of exhorting as somebody bawling me out, you know? 
Well, it's a little bit lighter than that. It's more of encouraging somebody to do right. You remember last week when the tax collectors and the soldiers came to John, what should we do? John simply gave them some examples of what they should do to live a right life. And that's what he was doing. John was exhorting the people. Okay, uh, here's Webster's Revised Unabridged Dictionary. The act or practice of exhorting, the act of inciting a, to laudable deeds. That's a good definition. To encourage others to do good deeds, right deeds, okay? Incitement to that which is good and commendable. And then he had a, had a second definition. Language intended to incite and encourage advice, counsel, and admonition. So admonition can be a part of exhorting, but it also is encouraging. Okay, here's a cross-reference, and we're going to see this cross-reference several times this morning. Hebrews 12, 5. And have you forgotten the, there's our word, the exhortation that addresses you as sons, this is a quote from the Old Testament, it is the Lord talking to us. Okay? My son do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. The author of Hebrews calls this an exhortation. Okay? So this person who wrote this, quoting this Old Testament, is saying, well, it's actually the Lord talking to us. It is called an exhortation. It is encouraging us. It is reminding us, but it is also admonishing us a bit. Okay, here's another cross-reference. Paul, the elderly, had a young man, Timothy. Uh, Timothy had grown to such a point as he was uh, left in difficult churches to help straighten them out. And Paul wrote First and Second Timothy uh, to Timothy. In fact, 2 Timothy is probably the last book that Paul wrote shortly before he was martyred, and he wrote this advice to Timothy. He says, preach the word. Okay, preach the Bible. Make sure you don't run off on all kinds of other things. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and here's our word, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Okay, so there it is. One of, the, one of the jobs of a pastor. These are called the pastoral epistles. Timothy was in the role in that church as a pastor, trying to straighten out the problems that were there. One of the jobs that a pastor has is that he needs to exhort people to do what is right. Exhorting. Okay. Also in our text, it says John the Baptist preached the good news. He exhorted the people, but he also preached the good news to the people. That would be encouraging, wouldn't it? Huh? Well, the word that's used here for good news is euangelion. Now, we've talked about this word before, but let me dissect it again for you. Angelion means message or news as you might translate it. The U prefix, E-U, comes from a Greek prefix, which means good. At funerals, we often give a eulogy about somebody. We get that word eulogy from this prefix. It means to say something good about somebody, okay? So it literally means, a uh, Greek word literally means a good message or the good news. Now, if you change that e to the, e, the u, if you change the u to a v, which happens when you come from one language to another, you got our English word evangelism. See, we get our word evangelism from this Greek word. Okay, evangelism is sharing good news to others. One of the popular songs on on WCSG Christian Radio is Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. I didn't sing that very well, but I like that song. Let Me Tell You About My Jesus. Huh? Sharing the good news with others. The gospel 
of the coming Messiah, of course this is going back to John, was good news to those coming to hear John. Remember there were people were flocking, he was kind of a fad, people were coming out into the wilderness there and flocking to hear what he had to say, and he pointed them to Jesus. He shared, he not only admonished them, but he shared good news with them. It was good news because it meant salvation and the forgiveness of their sins. So he exhorted them, but he also gave them good news. That's kind of, kind of what you got to do with children. You, you ball them out for being naughty, and then you encourage them afterwards. Huh? Okay, point number two. John's boldness to speak to Herod's sin. Let me ask you something. <laughs> and it may come to this in the United States. What, uh, what if it was made illegal to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ? And we met for our church service and in walked uh, a couple of police officers, armed police officers, to see if we obeyed that law or not. Well, I know you're sitting there. It's Pastor Herrick who's going to get in trouble. But, but uh, Paul told Timothy, you know, preach the word when it's convenient and when it's not convenient, in season and out of season. You know, while John the Baptist was not intimidated by King Herod, he said this, but Herod the Tetrarch, who had been, now here's another word we're going to look at. Um, John was exhorting the people, right? Well, he reproved uh, Herod. Uh, he had been, Herod had been reproved by him for Herodias. We're going to talk about her in just a minute, his brother's wife, and for all the evil things that Herod had done. Okay, who is Herodias? Well, Herodias in the Bible is notorious for being a woman who desired John the Baptist's head on a platter. We're going to look at that story in just a minute. She was the unlawful wife, unlawful wife of the Tetrarch Herod Antipas. Now, I actually kind of copied this. It says, who had formerly been the wife of Herod's brother Philip. She hadn't formerly been. She still was. Uh, Herod, who was leader of that, uh, uh, Rome gave him authority. Herod said to his brother, hey, your wife is good looking, this Herodias. I think I'm going to take her to be my wife. And he did, because he was Herod. He could do whatever he wanted to do, and his brother couldn't do anything. The problem was there was never a divorce between Philip and her, and so she was married to two people at the same time. And not only that, but... As the granddaughter of Herod the Great, Herodias was herself a niece to both Philip and Herod. <laughs> so Philip had married his niece, and then Herod thought she was good looking, so Herod simply took her and married her, and so she was married, a niece was married to two of her uncles. Well, and this was the ruler of the country, you know. Uh, so most people, oh, do you hear what Herod did? You know, they were mumbling about it, but not John. John spoke out about it. John didn't mince any words. He reproved Herod. All right, so let's look at that word, reprove. What does that mean? Well, it means to rebuke, reprimand, admonish, and repro or reproach. It isn't as kind of a word as we looked at exhorting. You know, exhorting also kind of encourage, it, it contains encouragement. Reprove is a bit stronger. You're bawling them out. You're, you're telling them they have done wrong. Reprove implies an often kindly intent to correct a fault. We're going to look at, coming up, I know I shouldn't tell you now because it's coming up, but we're going to look at in the book of Proverbs, the wise man listens when he is reproved by others. We're going to look at that. In the Bible, God reproves. Okay, that verse that we looked at a little minute ago, we're going to look at it again. Christians are encouraged 
to reprove others when necessary. You know, this is something we don't do. Well, that's their life. They can live it how they want. What right do I have telling them that they're living in sin? Well, the Bible tells us that we need to look at our Christian brothers and sisters, and if there is sin in their life, Matthew uh, 18 tells us the steps. We are to go to them and kindly um, reprove them. Okay? That, is a, that is a job that we have for one another, toward one another. Taken from, uh, oh, this was taken from uh, Merriam-Webster again. Okay, here's a cross-reference. Hey, that's the same cross-reference we looked at earlier. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Not only does he tell him to exhort, but he tells him to reprove, and in another Greek word he uses there, and to rebuke with complete patience and teaching. I, I, I kind of smile. When Timothy was up there preaching, he had to have patience because when he rebuked and reproved and exhorted, they didn't straighten out the first time. <laughs> Paul told them, keep at it. Preach in season and out of season. Uh, your reproof isn't going to be listened to the first time, so have patience and just keep going on with it. So reprove, rebuke, and exhort. What's the difference between those three words? Well, when we consult Webster for some definitions, we note the following. Reprove, to express disapproval, to censure, and Webster even has the word rebuke in the definition of the word reprove. Okay, so they're very similar to one another. Rebuke, he says, to blame or scold in a sharp way, to reprimand. So both of these words, reprove and rebuke, are a bit more, are a bit stronger than to exhort. To exhort, you're encouraging, you're pleading with them to do what's right. Uh, John exhorted the people, but when it came to Herod, he reproved Herod. Exhort is to encourage earnestly by advice, warning, admonish strongly. Okay, so you see, you can exhort somebody. If they don't listen, maybe you need to go to the levels of reproving and rebuking. <laughs> Here's another cross-reference. Hey, wait a minute. We looked at that verse earlier in our sermon. And have you not forgotten the exhortation? Okay, so it is called an exhortation that addresses you as sons. And this is a quote from the Old Testament. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. So this is an interesting verse. The Lord, when he sees us wandering away, when he sees that we as Christians have sin in our life, he will reprove us. How does he reprove us? He often disciplines us. He brings something in our life that is difficult, that is hard, Go to John chapter uh, 15 about the vine and the branches. He prunes us that we can bring forth more fruit. Um, it equates discipline with reproof from the Lord. The Lord is willing to reprove our lives. Okay, we should listen to a rebuke. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 1, and I picked two of them. They're, the book of Proverbs is full of verses about us reproving others and others reproving us. Notice what Proverbs 13, 1 says. A wise son hears his father's instruction. Okay, so the father is trying to get his son to take the right path, to do what is right. A wise son listens to that. Then it says, but a scoffer, and scoffer in the book of Proverbs is simply another name for a fool, <laughs> fooey on that kind of stuff. He scoffs at wise instruction. A scoffer does not listen to a rebuke. 
If there were any teenagers here today, I would tell them that they, <coughs> if there were any teenagers here today, I would tell them that they are wise if they listen to their parents' counsel. Huh? A wise son hears his father's instruction, but a scoffer does not listen to rebuke. Proverbs 17.10, here's another one. I, and as I said, there are many others. I just plucked these couple out. A rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding, so a wise person, a man of understanding, than a hundred blows to a fool. <coughs> hey, you need to straighten your life out. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the fool isn't going to listen. A, a reproof and an exhortation, a rebuke, isn't going to mean anything to a, to a fool. Yeah, that simply uses the word fool here. A scoffer. He's just going to reject it and go on his way. It's not going to mean anything to him. But a person who is concerned about doing what's right, when somebody rebukes them, they're going to listen to that. It may even hurt their feelings, but that's okay if it helps straighten them out. It's going to go deep into them, and they're going to listen to it, and they're going to say, that person was right in telling me that. I need to get that out of my life, and I need to start walking more faithfully with the Lord. Husbands and wives, you can be exhorters and even <laughs> rebukers to one another. And when that happens, your mate, don't get mad about it. Listen to what they have to say. They are telling you that out of love. Paul says um, to speak the truth in love. And if we're concerned about somebody, especially some Christian who's walking away from the Lord or is beginning to practice some dangerous activities that you know is not going to help their Christian life, but is going to perhaps lead them off away from the Lord, maybe you need to take the responsibility out of love and speak the truth to them and exhort, admonish, and rebuke and reprove them. And if they're wise, they will listen to you and they will appreciate what you had to say to them because they will know that you did it out of love. So your attitude in doing those things is really important too. If you come to somebody with a holier-than-thou attitude or that I'm better than you are and you better get your life straightened around, uh, they're probably not going to listen to that. But if they know you've come in love, hey, I struggle with the same things you struggle with. But you know what? I found that it really hurt me. Maybe share something in the past when you had wandered from the Lord and share that with them. And with a humble attitude, they're going to appreciate what you have to say. Okay. John was bold to rebuke a king. I got a cross-reference. I like this cross-reference. Found in Acts chapter 4. Uh, they had been sharing the gospel, particularly Peter and John, and the, uh, the Jewish government, Rome, allowed the Jews to have some authority. They arrested Peter and John, beat them, and told them not to preach in that name anymore. Well, Peter and John came back to the church, and they all got together, and they, what did they do? They prayed. I think if, if that happened to us, we would pray, Oh Lord, don't let that happen to me again. Give me wisdom of when I should be quiet and not share the gospel so I don't get in trouble. You know, that's the type of thing we would say. That's not what they prayed. Look at what they prayed. They had just been in trouble by the government for preaching the gospel. Okay? Then they come together to pray and they said, And now, Lord, look upon their threats. And grant to your servants, grant to us, to continue to speak your word with all boldness. Isn't that good? Isn't that something? They, they weren't saying, oh, Lord, protect us, help us to be quiet, you know. They said, no, Lord, give us boldness to go out there and share the gospel with others. We don't care what they said. We need to share the gospel. We need to pray for boldness in our lives. 
Okay. Point number three. John locked up in prison. I gotta watch my time here. He added, Herod added to all the other sins that John was rebuking him about that he locked up John in prison. Okay, so uh, the last straw. He locked up John in prison. Some kind of full, here's the full story, okay? Luke only gives us that phrase. We need to kind of know what the other Gospels fill in the story. Matthew 14, verses 3 through 12. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife. Now that's basically what Luke had told us. But Matthew goes on. Because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Married to your brother and your niece, and now you've simply taken her as your wife. And though you wanted to put, though he wanted to put him to death, he feared the people. So he didn't like what John was saying. Put him in prison, but didn't have, Herod didn't have the guts to, to end John. He just left him in prison because of what the people would say. Because they held him to be a prophet. Remember, they were all flocking out to hear him talk. But when Herod's birthday came... The daughter, he threw a great big birthday party. The daughter of Herodias, now this was Philip's, Herodias' daughter, not Herod's daughter, uh, danced before the company and pleased Herod so that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother. So she snuck over to her mother and says, what should I ask for, what should I ask for? And the mother says, tell him Give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry. But because of his oaths and because of the guests, he had said it right publicly, I'll give you anything you want. And then when she asked for John the Baptist's head, he had to follow through. Uh, he commanded it to be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison and his head, and this is, this is really gory, and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mom. Probably all excited. Hey, mom, look what I got. Look what, look what Herod did for me. It's the head of John the Baptist, still bloody, on a platter, and she brings it to her mom. You know, we, we had something sad this week. We had to get rid of our cats. Uh, they were peeing and pooping all over the house, you know, and we didn't want to do it. But but uh, before that, every once in a while we would go away and we'd come home and right in front of the door, one of our cats had gone into the kid, our granddaughter's room and found a toy and brought it out and laid it right in front of the door. Um, and you've heard of, of cats who catch a mouse and bring it home to their master, giving them a gift. Well, <laughs> I think of this. This daughter come, brought the head of John the Baptist on a platter to her, to her mother, you know. And the disciples came and took the body and buried it, and they were and told Jesus. Okay, Luke 7, several chapters down from where we are in Luke. Luke adds more to the story. John the Baptist is in prison. Okay, here in Luke 3, he gets put in prison. But while he was in prison, he began to wonder. This Jesus that I pointed out and said he was the Messiah, I wonder if he really is. Here's what John the Baptist did when he was in prison. The disciples of John reported all these things to, to John while he was in prison. They'd go visit him. And John, calling two of his disciples to him, sent them to the Lord, sent them to Jesus, saying, Are you the one who is coming, or shall we look for another? He was doubting. He was wondering whether Jesus really was that Christ. He had said that earlier. Now he's put in prison, and while he was in prison, he was wondering. So he sent two of his disciples to go ask Jesus. And when the men came to Jesus, came to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you, saying, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? In that hour, he healed many people. Jesus says, just wait a minute. Let me do some stuff here. And Jesus healed many diseases and plagues and cast out evil spirits. 
and on many who were blind he bestowed sight. Okay, so they're waiting for Jesus' answer, watching Jesus do all these miracles. And he said to them, and then Jesus comes back to those two, and he says, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up. He raised Lazarus from the dead. The poor have good news preached to them. In other words, John, this is all evidence that I really am the Christ. Huh? Uh, and, blessed, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So he sent them back to John, and they reported that to him. Okay, I'm down to the end here. Out of time, almost out of time anyway. John exhorted and reproved the people of their sins. He exhorted, he both exhorted the people... He reproved Herod. Remember, reprove is a bit stronger than just exhorting. So he was kind to the people, but those who were more prominent, those who should have known better, he rebuked, reproved. He even dared to reprove the king for the public sin in his life. He had married his brother's wife. And everybody knew it. Everyone knew what was going on. It was against the word of God. And he rebuked the king publicly. His boldness caused him to be put in prison eventually to get his head cut off or that. He suffered for doing what is right. Isn't that something? We get the misconception that when we do what's right, life is going to be nice and easy with no problems. Uh, it wasn't for John the Baptist. Even though he did what was right, he got thrown in prison for it. I said here, we need to do what's right, no matter what the outcome may be. All right, let's bow in prayer. Father, thank you for the example of John the Baptist. I pray that you'll give us boldness. Boldness to speak what's right. Boldness to humbly exhort one another. Boldness to, to, to speak out against that which is unjust. Father, I pray that John the Baptist's example will be uh, something important in our lives. Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.